Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today it is my very great pleasure to welcome back to the programme a very good friend of the show, and indeed a very good friend, and someone without whom The Mind Renewed might never have got going in the first place. We welcome back Dr. Martin Erdman, who we haven't spoken to for some three and a half years. It's quite amazing to me how time has indeed flown. Dr. Erdman is director of the Verax Institute in Greenville, South Carolina. He has served as professor of philosophy at North Greenville University, as head of New Testament studies at the State Independent Seminary in Basel, Switzerland, and the Academy of Reformation Theology in Hanover, Germany. He also taught biblical studies at Patrick Henry College in Northern Virginia, and he was for several years senior scientist at the University Hospital in Basel and research fellow at the European Foundation of Clinical Nanomedicine, researching into the ethical implications of nanotechnology. Martin, welcome back to the show. It's wonderful to be speaking with you again. Well, thank you so much, Julian, for having me on your show. Well, it's quite amazing to me that it has been such a long time since we last spoke. And I suppose part of the reason why it doesn't seem that long is that we've remained in contact via email for all that time. So it's great to have been able to do that. But here we are, and we're going to be talking... Well, maybe I'll come to that in a moment. Before we do get on to that subject, perhaps we could just get a bit of an update on your work since we last spoke, because I know you've been on many, many missions and doing a, a lot of research on various subjects. So um, do you want to tell us what you've been doing, perhaps something about the missions particularly? Yes. Well, I continue doing my work with the Varex Institute, which I've set up and founded in 2003 in Switzerland. Uh, since we moved to the United States, I have set up a branch here in the United States, and it's basically a internet outreach. This means that I do publish articles in two languages, German and English, every day. And I do get quite a bit of traffic uh, to the website and obviously interact with those who read the articles and comment upon them. And it's a very fulfilling work. And I do reach out to quite a number of people in many different countries, people in New Zealand, Australia, Asian countries, Africa, but also primarily in Europe and here in the United States. Mm. And the things that you research about and write about, does it ring a bell with people? I believe so, yeah. I believe it meets a need, uh, at least for some people, because I do address a broad range of topics uh, under the general theme of discernment, spiritual discernment or apologetics, but it also includes uh, articles on theology and church history, philosophy. Mm. So my focus is a bit broader than most, but I think this meets, as I said, a specific need uh, among those who read the articles because they try to, or we try, I try to find the interconnections between these different topics of history and theology and philosophy uh, and also bringing them up to date, trying to bring out the specific ramifications or implications of these topics, historical topics uh, such as Romanticism or the Enlightenment or things like that, up to our time and see how those uh, specific ideologies influence our thinking. Yes, I think this is why your work is so important. That you do actually have that ability to make all these connections between various subjects. And I think that's something that many people are calling out for because we see things happening in our world and they can seem like isolated events, but they have they have histories and they have connections to philosophy. And so I think that's amazingly valuable work that you do. And one of the things that you have done a lot of work on and something we're not going to be speaking about today, but I do hope we will be speaking about it in the future, is the spiritualization of technology. And that is a yes. fascinating thing to look into. But what we're going to be talking about today is something that I think people might think, well, why would you want to talk about that? And yet it's a very important subject. And that yes. is civil religion, specifically American civil religion, because of the geopolitical importance of that country. But uh, more than that, because you say American civil religion should be understood as the most effective rival religion yes. to true Christianity. Yes. In America. Let me say that again. American civil religion understood as the most effective rival religion to true Christianity in America. So could you tell us briefly what that means? Very roughly, what is civil religion and why is it perhaps, particularly in America, something significant that is a rival to Christianity? Yes. 
Well, being engaged in apologetics, obviously, we always try to learn as much as we can about the opposing viewpoints so that we can present our arguments in favor of true Christianity. We have to be very careful not to misrepresent our opponents. And this really led me into that topic of civil religion, because I realized fairly soon, once I did some extensive study on dominionism, that behind dominionism is really a certain religious worldview which could be called civil religion or civic religion. As a matter of fact, some rather well-known sociologists in America have written articles on it, and we will come back to some of them. One in particular who has written extensively about that particular theme and has made it rather popular. So in that sense, I was very intrigued to look into it more deeply, and I did. Mm. And when I fairly quickly realized that even though the civil religion of America appears to be Christian, it is not at all what we consider to be true Christianity. And since you've asked me to define it a little bit further... (laughs) I think I do have to do this because we have to set the stage, we have to set a foundation for our further discussion on it. Well, I think I have basically three main points. And let me interject a little footnote on that. Most of the things I will tell you are not really original with me. I just have read the books. So it's not necessarily my own private opinion. It's general knowledge, which is easily accessible here in America. I will give you the three points in regards to defining civil religion. Well, a civil religion is a shared set of values, beliefs, and narratives, and practices that give a society cohesion and purpose. And just about any religion would fit into that definition. But since our context is America, Christianity is filling this lot. So they use a lot of Christian terms and refer to Christianity quite frequently. And obviously, we will have to give certain examples later on. All right. So if we were in Thailand, for example, we would be talking about a Buddhistic state religion or civil religion. Exactly. But it wouldn't be Buddhism. It would be a state religion with that kind of flavor. But in America, we have a state religion or a civil religion that has a Christian flavor. Exactly. Or if you are in a Muslim country like Morocco or Egypt, the state religion would have a Muslim or Islamic flavor to it. The same dynamics apply to these manifestations of civil religion in these different other contexts. Okay. And I just mentioned this as an example. If you look at the civil religion of Egypt, when the Muslim Brotherhood got into power a few years ago, the Prime Minister Morsi said, that, yes, we adhere to the Islamic faith and so on and so forth. And when he said, I am a technocrat, <laughs> he actually said it. And I could point you to the specific newspaper article I read on it in, I believe it was Time magazine. So if he is a technocrat, he basically said, well, my adherence is in name only to Islam. Because my true allegiance is to the religion of technocracy, which can appear in a Muslim context, looking like Islam. And that's just one example. But let me go on to my second point. Civil religion draws from highest common factors inherent in the religious faiths of the society. And I want to emphasize this religious faiths, not just one faith as well as from the society's culture, secular philosophy, and history. So it is more or less a package deal. It is not just one faith. It is also a philosophy, and it could be a secular philosophy. And obviously, the historic tradition of a country is also playing a very important part. And my third and and final point is, a civil religion stands separate and apart from dominant religion but not in deliberate contention. Mm. So that means that a civil religion is something completely different from what we consider to be one dominant faith. The one here in America is obviously Christianity. So it's not Christianity. 
But a civil religion tries not to appear in contention to that particular dominant faith. Once again, in a Thai situation, this would be, well, it's not Buddhism, but it appears like Buddhism. Or in a Muslim context, it is not Islam, but it appears like Islam. So we're not talking about a state church necessarily. We're talking about a state religion, which may or may not use elements of whatever religion is there in the country. And I think this might be difficult, more difficult for people in Britain to come to an understanding of simply because we have established religion here. We, we have a church of England, yeah. <laughs> whereas in the States, of course, there is that official separation between church and state. And yet yeah. you're talking about civil religion that does exist, but it's not the church. It's not the church, but it can cooperate with the church. And this is where it gets a bit tricky or a bit complex because it can cooperate with a state church system like you have it in England, but it's not the state church system as such. And I think that's a very important point to note. Okay. Well, I think this is quite tricky for us, for listeners to get their minds around. And I think the reason why is we need to understand some of the history of this in order to get to the picture. And so what I'd like to do is to take us on a journey back into the ancient world. Yes. Uh, because you say in one of your presentations that this whole phenomenon of the state religion or the state cult is not a modern thing. This has a long pedigree. So yes. let, let, let's go back to that. Could you tell us something about the relationship between religion and the state in ancient Greek and Roman cultures? Yes. As you well noted, it is not a modern phenomenon at all. As a matter of fact, it was extremely well developed in the ancient world. And thus, we have to go back to the ancient Greeks and the Romans. And we are talking about BC, before Christ was born, even hundreds mm. of years before Christ was born. Because in the ancient world, the state and the religion were basically one and the same. The religion was the most determining factor in a society during that time. It determined the laws, it determined the political administration, it even determined the imperial expansion of a specific city-state such as Athens or Rome. They all referred back to their particular civil religion. Now, obviously, these religions were distinct. The Roman religion was a bit different from the Greek religion, but they had uh, a lot of similarities. They worshipped the same gods, but just gave them different names. Like Zeus in Greek times and, and obviously uh, Jupiter uh, among the Romans. But the characteristics of these particular gods were extremely similar. Mm. But what needs to be kept in mind was the driving force behind politics was the religion, not vice versa. Nowadays, we think more in terms of politics or political system is the most determining factor in a society. But this was not the case in the ancient time. It was just the opposite way around. Religion determined politics. Hmm. I mean, one of the questions about the ancient Greek and Roman cultures would be, do you think the religions at the time were generally believed by the elites hmm. or were they mostly used as a means of control, do you think? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. Hmm. You have to look at the views of individual rulers. I believe some of them were quite cynical, hmm. uh, but... I believe they accommodated themselves extremely well to the general belief system and they were regarded as gods themselves or at least the, the high priests of the god. Yes. So uh, political rulers were really first and foremost the high priests of a state cult and their particular power derived from their specific religious status in society, not the other way around. And I think that this is a kind of thinking we, we need to get used to because we are conditioned in our thinking from our humanistic education or even Christian education to think in, in very different terms. Yes. But in the ancient world, the officer of a state was the priest. Mm. He held the supreme rank. He controlled all affairs of state and court. And he ruled sometimes directly in the name of the gods. And under the priests were the kings. Now, sometimes they were one and the same. Sometimes they were representatives of the gods. Or they themselves were the priests or under the influence and control of the priestly caste. The priest of the state court, he was the supreme ruler. And this wasn't just, of course, the Greek and Roman empires. Yes. We would say the ancient Near East was characterized by this? 
Absolutely. Mm. It was very similar in all of the other in all of the other empires or city states, correct? I suppose it does make sense that we are religious beings, whether we happen to like that yeah. fact or not. Um, and so, therefore, if you're going to create an order by which people should live, then you're going to yeah. have reference to your religious worldview, but first of all. And as you say, it's very different for us living in the modern world because we, we tend to have a different attitude towards it. But we must try to understand this ancient way of looking at things because you say that it's really not gone. It really is with us, but it's just veiled. Yes. Um, so although the idea of the king as priest seems alien to us now, perhaps, it is actually relevant with the idea of the president, we're looking at America as pastor, yeah. the president as prophet, but we, yeah. we will get onto that in a bit. So I want to look at another step that you bring into this discussion, which is a division that gradually took place within the Hebrew state. Yes. Now, there are different points on the trajectory of change that one could identify. I know that you have pointed to Isaiah, the prophet, you have pointed to Elijah as well. Yes. Various people who have sort of opposed the status quo because they've seen the status quo go wrong and have called people to a true faith in God. And as a consequence of that, there's been a bifurcation yes. which has opened up something of a chasm between the state's religion and true inward religion. Very interesting development that you say can be traced through through Hebrew faith. Could you tell us something about that? Yes, exactly. You summarized it extremely well, but let me just add a few additional points to it. Well, once again, let me go back to the concept of cult and state in the ancient world, because we have to have this as our foundational understanding in order to see how it changed, or what Judaism and eventually the Christian church brought in which was very different from what the ancient world understood uh, in regards to that relationship between cult and state. Well, there was no distinction. The state was the cult, and by cult I mean the religion, the state religion. The state was the cult, and the cult was the state. There was no distinction, no separation between the two. The government was as much concerned with religious as with civil affairs. State laws rested upon the degrees of religion. So you had specific religious uh, degrees, laws, and they were also simultaneously the state laws. So I suppose the paradigm of that would be the Ten Commandments. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. In the context of the Judaistic religion, that was correct. The law of Moses, not just the Ten Commandments, but the law of Moses, sure. the Pentateuch, was basically the law of the land. One step further, the court ordinances or the religious ordinances were enforced by the power of the state. Once again, this is something extremely foreign to us in our context, that the state would come in and tell the pastor what he needs to do. Obviously, in, in England, it's a bit different because you do still have a state church, a state establishment. But here in the context of America, this would be extremely frowned upon if it would happen, that the state would come in and tell the pastor what he needs to preach, uh, how he should conduct his church affairs. But once again, this was just how it was in the ancient world. Court ordinances were enforced by the power of the state. And one final point, religious nonconformity was an offense against the state. So you had no freedom to choose your own religion. If you were born in a specific uh, state, like the Roman Empire, you were a devotee of that Roman state cult. You had no choice to do anything else. And if you wanted to do anything else, you were persecuted. Persecuted to the point of death. And as you know, that once this Christian faith established itself in the Roman Empire, the Christians didn't want to pay homage to Caesar, because Caesar was considered to be the god of that state cult. They didn't want to burn incense in front of the altar of Caesar, and thus they were persecuted. Hmm. 
Although there's an interesting, not a contradiction to that, but a nuancing of that with respect to the Jewish faith at the time, wasn't there? Because, of course, that land was overrun by Romans. It was yes. administered by Romans. And yet there was this uneasy state of coexistence where yeah. as long as the, the Jewish rulers were yes. not causing too much trouble, they were sort of patronizingly tolerated. But it was not a very happy situation. So you had a kind of state religion within a state religion in some ways. Yes, exactly. And that was not just true for the time. Israel was occupied by the Romans, but even prior to it, uh, when Babylon came in, or Persia, and, and later on Macedonia, uh, the extent of the great, uh, the king of Macedonia, uh, conquered that piece of land and imposed his particular state court on the people of Israel. Even though he quickly realized, as well as some of the other rulers, that that was a very difficult task to do because the Jews were rather stubborn. And obviously, uh, were very intent on continuing worshipping Yahweh. So if we follow this trajectory on, we have various prophets identifying the ways in which Israel and Judah have gone astray and calling people to a true inward a relationship with God, and along with that, a high regard for the word of God written down. So this inward religion, which paves the way towards Christianity. Now, I think some might think that in drawing this picture, you're doing a kind of history of religions thing and saying, oh, well, Christianity, therefore, is explained away by this kind of development. But you're, you're not really saying that, are you? No, not at all. What I'm saying is, ultimately, God intervened. Mm. His plan was to bring the Christian church into being. And the Christian church needed to be separate from the state cult. Because the members of the church were called upon to worship God and God alone in his son, Jesus Christ. The church could not be part of a state cult. And thus, a specific separation needed to happen. And this is basically what I tried to do going back to the history of the Jewish prophets, Isaiah and, and d different other ones, to show how God brought about a separation of his group of worshippers from those who worshipped the state cult. So this is why, when we read the New Testament, this is part of the reason why we find Jesus opposed by the priestly class and opposed by the Pharisees, because... He was actually challenging the state cult at the time. Exactly. Yes, that was what it was. This is why he was crucified, because he was accused to be the king of the Jews. Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees also knew that he was claiming to be the Messiah. This meant that he claimed to be also the highest religious authority in the land. And they could not tolerate that because they themselves wanted to occupy that position of power. And this is why they persecuted him and ultimately crucified him. So are you saying, therefore, that as followers of Jesus, if indeed we are followers of Jesus, that that stamps us as people who are necessarily in conflict with the prevailing state religion, the state cult, wherever we are, at any time, in any place? This is exactly what I'm saying. And if you go back to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Yes, uh, I can only affirm what you just said. In some ways, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you stand in direct opposition to the state court, regardless of what it is, and regardless in what country you reside. And yet a lot of people would look at a Christian today and they would identify that person with the state. And they would say, oh, yes, if somebody's a Christian, they're very conventional in their thinking, perhaps they're Church of England in this country or in the United States. They might say, oh, yes, that person's a Christian. No doubt they go along with everything that the government is trying to do, let's say, with regard to foreign policy or something like that. But the picture that you are painting there is quite different from that. Is this, therefore, what I've just described, a symptom of the way that people have been kind of brainwashed to think that the civil religion is real Christianity? Well, again, we are speaking in a Western context. So in some ways, yes, there is a certain deception going on that the state court poses to be 
true Christianity, or at least the state court seems to be sympathetic to the Christian faith. And thus, many Christians feel very much at ease living in such a situation because the state doesn't necessarily impose his authority upon the church and even in some ways supports the church uh, by giving it tax deferment and things like that. So in that sense, the state accommodates itself to the specific dominant religion. But remember what I said initially, there are two different things, two different religions. But the state court or the civil religion trying to be wise in the situation does not necessarily oppose the dominant religion. We, we are not in contention with each other in most cases. So in that sense, Christians can easily adapt themselves to that situation and, and be very happy living under a specific state court if they don't call to remembrance that the state court is nothing like true Christianity. And this is my point. This is my argument. We as Christians need to be conscious about the differences and not give in to the allurements and the temptations which the state court presents to us. Now, I'm not saying we should live in total opposition to it. I'm not saying we should rebel. Not at all. But we should be aware of the fact that these two religions are not compatible. I think it's a very important point that you make. Again, I think it's not easy for people to see. I mean, I'm saying that simply because when I first approached this subject, I didn't find it easy to see. So I think what we need to do is to concretize some of this in the contemporary American situation, because that's what we're talking about, with particular examples. Yes. But before I do that, I want to issue a kind of disclaimer. I've talked to you about this before the interview, and I think it's important to do that, because yeah. we are in no way trying to discredit American institutions, founding documents, historical persons, or anything like that. There is much about the United States that I personally admire. And I'm not for a moment thinking that the United Kingdom is immune to these kinds of criticisms either. We've already, already mentioned the UK a couple of times or, or any other country. I'm quite sure that we in the UK have a state religion of some sort, not as obvious as it was in former years, but it's still here. And, and I, just as an example for something that I've talked about on the podcast before, I would take previous Prime Minister David Cameron's attempts to tap into things like British values and <laughs> British exceptionalism ideas as evidence that there is some sort of quasi-religious state ideas that are you know, quite well alive in the UK that can be tapped into by elites. So this is not an attempt to run down the US. What, what we are concerned to do here is to point up this unhelpful collection of narratives that has been constructed around these elements of national life. And we're doing that to make people aware of how things can be manipulated. So having said that, then let's look at some of these elements of US national life and the way that they may indeed be manipulated. Um, now, you mentioned events, ideas, symbols, ideals of US public life, history, national celebration, and you point out some of their analogues in Christian belief and Christian practice. Um, and I think here you're drawing upon the work of one of those scholars that you mentioned earlier, so I will name him Robert Neely Bala, who was a professor of sociology at UC Berkeley, and we'll discuss more about him in a minute. So you list, yes. for example, I'll ask you to, to comment upon these in a, in a moment. So I'm just throwing a few of the examples out so that people can get a concrete idea of what we're talking about here. So yes. the American Revolution equals the Exodus, George Washington, Moses, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine. Prophets, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Apostles, the Boston Massacre, there you have your martyrs, King George III, there you have your devil figure, the Star Spangled Banner, there you have a holy flag, July the 4th, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, Sacred Holidays, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, your items there of scripture. Now, actually, when I saw that list, that's when my eyes were opened to this, because in concretizing it in that way, it does show that there is a religious dimension to those things that we don't normally think of in that way. So could I ask you to expand upon everything I've just said there? Yes, gladly. However, I think it would be helpful just to go back to the New Testament era first in order to establish what the normal Christian thinking, the normal Christian attitude should be to the state court. Because at that time, obviously, the Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire. And the way how they conducted themselves, the way how 
some of your apostles like Peter advised the Christians how they should live in such a situation is very helpful to us. So let me just go down a, a very brief list of attitudes Christians should assume when the state court is not on their side. The early Christians lived in the hope of the coming of the Lord. This was a very important point of doctrine as well as conduct. The early Christians looked forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. And this made them or helped them to endure very difficult situations. Yeah. They expected the world and its institutions to pass away. So they had an internal perspective. They realized that this world is not all there is. There's an eternal world, and the eternal world has actually intervened into the temporal uh, by Jesus coming uh, in, into this world. And they also anticipated the establishment of God's kingdom. So this is what they were looking forward to. God triumphant at the end of time. Just need to go and read the book of Revelation to understand how he will do it. Then, very important, they took up a negative attitude towards the state. And that was not very difficult for them to do because they were literally persecuted. So in that sense, they looked upon the state as something which was antagonistic to them and to their faith. But they maintained friendly relations towards the state. They paid their taxes. They obeyed the magistrates, except in matters of worship. So both attitudes are very important. Mm. As you say, it was not out-and-out out opposition. It was more a case of claiming that Jesus is the true king. Correct. And therefore, he is the one who has the, the ultimate authority in the Christian's life. So insofar as the state comes along and makes claims or demands that go contrary to Jesus' kingship, then that's where the conflict takes place. Exactly. Now let's update that whole understanding uh, to our time. And yes, you mentioned certain aspects of the state court or civic religion here in the United States. And obviously it has to do with the American history, as it should be, with the Revolutionary War and all of that, and then obviously the Civil War up to our time. And there were certain aspects, like the 4th of July, which was the day when the Declaration of Independence was signed, which became the national holiday and things like that. And all of these holidays, like Memorial Hall Day and then different other ones, could also be looked upon as religious observances. And I think Bela, whom you mentioned, used these examples very distinctly to point to the religious content as well as the religious foundation of some of these national holidays. And I believe his point is well taken, and I do take it. And he became famous for pointing to these uh, observances as religious observances and as part of the civil religion here, here in the United States. But many of these days of observances or practices also refer back to the Christian faith. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. Because obviously in the mind of many Americans, many American Christians, one becomes like the other. So if you in some ways criticize, I'm not doing this, but if, in some ways if you criticize certain aspects about American culture, American Christians feel in some ways uh, apprehensive about it because they immediately equate that criticism with a criticism of their faith, their Christian faith. And this is not my intention at all, but it can be perceived like that. I just want to point out that there are two different faiths, and they look rather similar. But if you analyze these two different faiths, the state cult and the true Christian faith, you will realize that they are very different, so different that the state cult is really the most successful rival religion mm. in America to true Christian faith. Mm. 
I want to echo that, actually. Of course, in my mind at the moment is uh, some of the comments of Murray Rothbard about how the, the yes. state uses religion. Um, but I actually want to come back to Robert Neely Bala and yes. um, how he talks about, he doesn't use the phrase connotation words. I think that's actually a phrase from Francis Schaeffer, but it, it fits. Um, how quasi-religious language is used by the state and yet it doesn't quite mean the same thing that people think it does and so I think maybe that's part of the explanation why people get so hot under the collar about your, your criticism yeah. of this kind of thing yeah. so um, I mean one of the things that Bala says in his essay Civil Religion in America which was written in 1966 he says that the founding fathers very much set the tone for this American civil religion and he points to various flavors or spiritual elements of this civil religion such as um, it tends to towards being Unitarian, it tends towards being austere, yes. it tends towards emphasizing social order, it tends to be deistic, yes. but in a very special sense. Um, most people think of deism as, you know, God sets everything going like clockwork and then isn't interested in his creation, but that's not quite what Bala means because he says that deistic God is still very concerned with what goes on in America and what America stands for. Yes. Um, so, I mean, once yeah. you deconstruct some of this Christian terminology to mean things like austerity and Unitarianism and deism, then that I think people would not be quite so protective of some of those yes. Christian terms. <laughs> if you mean God, you actually mean, yeah. what, a deistic God? who's just concerned about America? Well, wow. that's not what we think. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's very important to define the terms being used. Mm -hmm. What do certain proponents of that state court mean when they use the term God? <laughs> and they do tell you, and if you listen carefully to their particular definitions, you realize, if you are Christians, you realize that their definitions of God is very different from your own definition. But since they use the identical or similar terms, they can be rather confusing if you don't listen carefully. Like, for example, the God of nature. Uh, this is language taken from the uh, Declaration of Independence. Did Jefferson truly mean the Christian God? He's famous also for his Jefferson Bible. And the Jefferson Bible is a very thin <laughs> book because he cut out many of the stories found in the New Testament especially those which pointed to miracles, supernatural intervention of God. He was not very happy about these passages, so he simply cut them out. And yes, he was a deist. He believed in a supernatural being, but it was not the Christian God. And this needs to be emphasized. And thus, if the religious emphasis of uh, the state court of America is based on that deistic, universalistic understanding of religion, that's proof positive that it's not Christianity at all. Yes, and I'm thinking in the modern context, when you use the word God, it's very politically expedient to mean by that the Christian God and nature and Allah and a new age version of reality, anything you like, so that everybody can be unified by this word God and perhaps give you the vote. <laughs> yes, correct. And, and it's also important when we consider certain expressions being used or certain phrases being used in general culture. America is God's chosen nation or the president's authority is from God or social justice cannot only be based on law. It must also come from religion or God bless America. I mean, just about every politician ends his speech by saying God bless America. But what do they truly mean by that? And then obviously some books are rather helpful and I, I found a book by Randall Bormer, and he used to be a theologian. I believe he also was keenly interested in church history. So this is his background. But he wrote a book by the title of Redeemer, just Redeemer. That was the title of a book, Redeemer. And if you look at the cover of the book, underneath that title Redeemer is the face of President Jimmy Carter. <laughs> So it's okay. very, yeah. very clear by just looking at the cover of that particular book, whom he means by Redeemer. Yeah. And then obviously you, you open the book and your expectations are fulfilled right away. He portrays Carter to be the most uh, successful, the most glorified president of American history. 
And yet if we come more up to date, then of course we had the whole Obama mania yes. that played upon the whole messianic yep. uh, idea. Um, I want to ask you about presidents uh, in a moment. That'll be a nice segue yep. to that. But I did want to just bring up a quote that I think well uh, illustrates this connotation language. You had a quote from Albert Beveridge, who was a, yeah. a senator around the turn of the 20th century. And um, he was speaking here, addressing the president. And let me just quote from what he says, because I think this is uh, quite revealing. This goes way back. Uh, Mr. President, the times call for candor. We will not renounce our part in the mission of our race, trustee, under God, of the civilization of the world. And we will move forward to our work with gratitude for a task worthy of our strength and thanksgiving to Almighty God that he has marked us as his chosen people henceforth to lead in the regeneration of the world. That is packed with Christian terminology, not so many Christian ideas, although yes. it does link to Christian ideas and yet yeah. moves them in a different direction in what I would think is a very humanistic direction, actually, and is going to connect to the global dimension, which I want to discuss with you in a few moments. Yeah. Um, let's just go to the presidents, because, yes. again, um, here we have our king figure, maybe our king stroke priest figure in some ways. So we have the president who is expected to serve to some extent as a pastor of the nation, as a priest of the yes. nation. How would you say those functions manifest themselves in public life? Yes, obviously the politicians use religious language and they borrow these terms from a Christian faith and they are not apologetic about it. Now, obviously in Europe, it would be very different. But here in America, they are not apologetic. As a matter of fact, uh, you could go back to Benjamin Harrison who was president from 1889 to 1893, he started that tradition of interspersing Christian terminology in all of his speeches. And he basically made it into a habit of his to allude to Christian ethics when he was speaking about social and economic matters, or he helped in the establishment of a social gospel and the progressive movement. Progressive movement was the political side the secular side, and the social gospel was the so-called Christian side of the same movement. And he created a national climate to solve social problems by government action. And all of this he couched in Christian terminology. So he basically set uh, the tone for all the subsequent presidents, uh, and he very well followed in his footsteps and when, for ex yeah, go ahead. No, I was just thinking of some of the phrases that might come out, and uh, we could think of anything, couldn't we? Like um, calling a nation to sacrifice for war, or, yes. or sacrifice for austerity. And actually, I was thinking of Margaret Thatcher back in the yes. 1980s. So we're, you know, obviously not president, but prime minister here, saying, you know, we're living in very difficult times. We need a time of of tightening our belts. You know, so what is she doing there? Yeah. She is pastor of the nation to some extent. And I, I'm also thinking of this obnoxious business we've had about British values here yeah. uh, with David Cameron saying, you know, we need to live up to these British values. Again, it's that sort of preachiness there and leading the nation to repentance over various things that have happened and leading the nation in mourning. All these, I see lots of pastoral functions there in the uh, prime minister and in the president. And I have to say I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. Yeah, well, you should, because obviously they use the vehicle of the civil religion. And what they speak about in Christian terms obviously has nothing to do with the Christian faith itself. And it's basically a very deceptive way of dealing with your population, which is uh, at least to a large part very favorably disposed towards the Christian faith. Let me give you uh, just a few more examples I read an article by William Sapphire about the Clinton presidency, or at least about his presidential campaign in 1992. And this is what William Sapphire wrote about Clinton and his presidential campaign. Never has the name of God been so frequently invoked, and never has this or any nation been so thoroughly and systematically blessed. End of quote. This is how... William Jefferson Clinton conducted his presidential campaign. And obviously we know he was voted into office. But it, it was not just him. Just about every modern president after he got into power or before he got into power published a book about his Christian faith. 
or asked someone to write a book about his Christian faith. Yeah. And I have, once again, a very interesting example in regards to President Ronald Reagan. And the author is Mary Beth Brown. The book title is The Hand of Providence, The Strong and Quiet Faith of Ronald Reagan. That's the title of the book, Hand of Providence. Mm. And then, uh, once again, I'm quoting from the book description. This book explores the life and personality of Ronald Reagan by focusing on his deep felt Christian beliefs and showing how faith guided him along his distinguished career and led him to his unprecedented success. Brown weaves a magnificent story of Reagan's strong devotion to God that will not only inspire Christians to enter public service and allow their faith to motivate all their actions, but also help point others to the cross of Jesus Christ a cause that was near and dear to President Reagan's heart, end of quote. And I think this is a, just a perfect vote to describe how the civil religion is using Christian terminology to portray a picture of a specific politician in a very favorable light. Mentioning there Bill Clinton, I was thinking of Hillary did exactly the same thing with a pre-election speech. We were talking about her Christian upbringing, her Methodist upbringing. And so immediately my ears went up as a Methodist, of course. Yes. And I was just thinking, what a contrast to that gushing speech that she gave and that evidence of what she said behind the camera, well, actually in front of the camera, behind the broadcast, as it were, when Gaddafi died. Oh, we came, we saw he died. Ha ha ha. And I thought, oh, yes. heavens, what a contrast yeah. there. I'm not at all sure about your Christian faith, yeah. uh, my dear. So there are others yeah. here. So you have uh, George Bush, you mentioned, and we've already talked yeah. about Obama. And of course, when we think about George Bush, he played, it seems to me anyway, he, he played the evangelical Christian card very strongly. But I remain doubtful, to be honest. Yeah. Well, once again, I read an article which was quite revealing. The title of the article was Civil Religion, Fundamentalism, and the Politics and Policies of George W. Bush, published 2004 in the Journal of Political Science. And the author makes some very interesting points. Usually, if you think about the presidency of George W. Bush and the way how he included Christian terminology in his speeches, it was quite pronounced. But when I was reading this article, the author contended that George W. Bush actually used civil religious metaphors and images, not Christian ones. Mm. And that he rarely used language specific to any Christian belief. Uh -huh. And that was utterly surprising to me because I had the opposite impression of George W. Bush. Yes. But if you actually analyze his speeches as this author did, you could come to that same conclusion that the way Bush expressed himself was not in Christian terms, but in terms of particular civil religion. And I believe that is in some ways a watershed because slowly but surely these presidents move away from using Christian terminology. And I believe George W. Bush was the very first one who claimed to be a Christian but actually moved away from a Christian faith deliberately. Now, that is fascinating. I mean, I noticed that there were some very high-profile Christian thinkers who were very keen on Bush and very excited by the seeming fact that he was a you know, conservative Christian. And yes. yet, I and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, I saw a very good documentary by Adam Curtis called The Power of Nightmares. And in that documentary, he made the point that the neocons had very deliberately courted the conservative Christians in the last quarter of the 20th century, obviously in order to establish their power base. And I thought yes. to myself, is this what we're seeing going on here with Bush? I mean, I to yes. what extent he's conscious of what he was doing, because I, you know, I'm not too impressed by the man. To what extent he was a puppet, I, I don't know. But what was going on, what was coming out of his yes. mouth, um, is this prepared for him to say just in order to manipulate people to accept the agenda that was being placed in front of people? Yes, I think they appeared to the Christian constituency. There's no doubt about that. But I believe they also 
in deliberate ways deceived the Christians. Mm. And and the Christians were so happy to have a president who claimed to be a Christian, but they did not actually look too closely what he truly said. Once again, Bush said the presidents in regard to leaving out Christian terminologies. And if you look at some of the things Barack Obama said in the meantime, he portrayed American, the American nation as a people unified by a shared belief in the American creed. He didn't say Christian creed. And I think this is very uh, revealing. Let me just repeat this again. He portrayed America as a people unified by a shared belief in the American creed and sanctified by the symbolism of an American civil religion. And this is taken from a campaign speech he gave in 2008. So he was, again, I believe, very clear in leaving behind that kind of Christian terminology which already uh, George W. Bush set in motion, uh, that tendency of leaving these terms out of his speech. Which fits with one of the people I'm going to ask you about in a bit, the academic Claire Zrin, if that's how you pronounce it, yes, who, Zrin, who yeah. says that the neocons are intent on breaking with the past, yes. but nevertheless using the connotations of the past. So maybe we see that happening in those kinds of statements. Yes. Um, I want to come back to the analysis of Bala with respect to his stages of the development of this civil religion. Mm -hmm. because it then will allow us to look forward to a further stage that he anticipates. Um, yes. So you agree, you said earlier, that you basically agree with his analysis that you have a, a first stage, you have the American Revolution, so we're looking there at the 1770s, out of that comes the Declaration of Independence, Constitution. Yeah. Now this is linked in the public mind with Christian Jewish ideas of exodus, so we have a leaving behind of Britain, we have a leaving behind yeah. in some way of Europe, so we might consider that to be an escape from Egypt, <laughs> breaking free from bondage. Yeah. Okay, that's a kind of first step there. And then we have a second step with the Civil War, so we're looking at 100 years later, basically 1860, so linked in the public mind with New Testament motives, such as sacrifice, yeah. dying for the cause. We're all one in Christ now. Um, there isn't this division between races. Uh, the new birth of the nation, so we have a second step there. Now, he speaks then about a third step. Now, he's speaking at his contemporary situation in the 1960s, and the third step, so then, is World War II has recently finished, and yes. we now have the Cold War that's precipitated by the end of the Second World War. And he sees yeah. here this American civil religion changing, morphing, still existing, but morphing towards a more global conception of civil religion. Still American, but global in its outlook. That's not to say that none of this had been there before. It had been there before in that quote that I talked about before. Um, yes. you know, Dear President, <laughs> we're going to change the world. But a new emphasis upon that. So I suppose my question to you here is this third step towards a more global view of this civil religion. Do you agree? Well, I think I need to say one more thing about it. What I'm asking is, do you agree with his analysis of this, that it's a move away from thinking in more outward terms, like an exodus from British rule, towards a more inward exodus from the old man, the yes. old ways of thinking, yeah. petty nationalism, genocide, and you know the things that, that have happened in the 20th century. Yes. We need to change the inner man, create the new universal man. And I suppose Kennedy is the figure there that pops up. Do you, do you agree with that basic picture he paints? I think I would agree with it, yes. And you also have to take into account Bela's own philosophical or ideological outlook. And we just have to say it because he himself described uh, his ideology as Marxist. He looked upon religion not favorably as such, but he realized that the particular American civil religion can be used for his own purpose of spreading Marxism. And that is very important to know because, yes, as we know, uh, a Marxist wants to bring about uh, a new society and, and the way how that new society comes about is by changing 
human beings, where dispositions, where likes, where ethics, and so on and so forth, where faith. And and I believe in that sense, I do agree with you. But I would also like to add that this is Bela's particular interpretation. Yes, yes. And obviously, if you are not a Marxist, you would possibly come to a different interpretation. And there are others who obviously have some other viewpoints which may add to the equation. Yes. Yes, I got the impression from reading him that he was not against the idea of the civil religion. He accepted it and thought it was inevitable, really. And I suppose that's yes. a Marxist kind of idea. This is the outworking yeah. of history kind of idea. But he was nevertheless yeah. critical of the dangers. You know, he was pointing to the dangers that were there. And I thought that yes. was very interesting because yeah. we do see some of that come out in the more recent analysis by Claire's Rin um, with respect to the neocons. So um, yes, very interesting analysis. It, though he was a Marxist, he was spot on in many of the things that he said. So I think we can learn from people we disagree with, nevertheless. Yes, so exactly. So if yes. we have this morphing to a more universal vision that seems to be a morphing towards global civil religion in a kind of soft sense. But then there's another morphing, which Klezrin identifies with what he calls the neo-Jacobins, when we can say the neocons. Yes. I'll ask you about the Jacobins in a second. Et so this yep. is a, a kind of hard yep. version of this global civil order, civil religion, that we can very clearly see in our troubled world today. And amazing, really, that... We're talking here about Professor Klazerin talking about this in 1991, <laughs> warning about this. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So did, this is a very complex um, landscape that we're talking about here. But I, just for simplicity, I want to see this new global vision in, with two arms to it. The sort of soft, sort of Marxist, changing the inner man kind of view of things and the hard kind of almost at the barrel of the gun trying to change the world that way with the neocons and neo-Jacobins. So could you describe to us why it is that Klezrin describes these people as neo-Jacobins rather than neocons? Yes, but you are correct in stating that it is a very complex issue. And you need to go back to the original Jacobins, uh, the ones who were in power in France in the second phase of the French Revolution. And obviously the most famous uh, Jacobin was uh, Robespierre. So you have to have a specific historic understanding of the original Jacobins in order to make the equation with what Glass Rehn calls the neo-Jacobins mm. in American politics. And obviously he identifies them with the neoconservatives, correct? I personally believe that that equation is straight on. It's a very astute observation, and I believe it's correct. But it's also radical. By radical, I mean it does not fit easily into our categories of thinking about conservatives, because obviously the Jacobins were the original left-wing politicians. They invented left-wing politics. It is left-wing because in the assembly, General Assembly, they wanted to sit on the left side of the assembly because they said, they reasoned that Everyone who is in favor of God sits on his right hand. Jesus sits on the right hand of God. So to make a public statement that we are totally opposed to the Christian God, we sit on the left side of the assembly. And this is how the left-wing politics came about. It was a public statement in utter opposition to Christianity. And so if Glasserian equates the neoconservatives with neo-Jacobin policy, he basically says this is left-wing politics. It's not conservatism at all. Once again, I believe the equation is correct. And then obviously he goes into the details and he brings out all the parallels of what the original Jacobins believed and wanted to achieve. They wanted to achieve a perfect world republic with themselves in power. How can we achieve this? Well, we have to force everyone to agree with our policies. And that led ultimately to the great terror. So yes, it is a ideology which is imposed by brute force. Mm. 
And this is where we have the connection with Trotskyism, do we not? Because yes. I was speaking to uh, Paul Craig Roberts, and he was saying in the interview that many of the neocons started out life as Trotskyites, yes. and they reinterpreted their desire to take over <laughs> the whole show. And um, there lots of comments on when I put it on YouTube saying, this is nonsense because the neocons are right wing. Oh, oh, and, and no, we are extent, not. I'm thinking that the, the terms left and right are almost useless. We have yeah. to have them because the terms are used, but they get in the way of understanding, don't they? So would I be right in saying that really we should think of the Jacobins as being revolutionary in spirit, doing things by force, wanting to change the status quo, and it's the ends justify the means, and the ends that yes. are in view are changing the order, changing how people think and behave. And in their view, this is the right thing to do yes. because it's going to be the good outcome in the end, but it doesn't matter how you get there. Correct. And they called that particular outcome by the term virtuous. They wanted to have the virtuous republic set up. But let me just quote a very brief section out of Glass Green's book, America, the Virtuous, The Crisis of Democracy and the Quest for Empire. The book he wrote showing the parallels between the original Jacobins in France and the neoconservatives in America pursuing the same policies. And it's a short quote, but it points to the right direction. In the second half of the 20th century, a distinctly American form of Jacobinism evolved, rhetorically dedicated to doing good for the world. But fundamentally motivated by a will to dominate. And there you have the two main thoughts, dedicated to doing good for the world and then motivated by a will to dominate. And this is exactly, or it's a very good description of the original Jacobins and thus the parallels to the neoconservatives is immediate and direct. Fascinating. And I wanted to ask you in connection with this, whether you think there is any significance to what George W. Bush said at his second inaugural speech. He used the phrase fire in the minds of men. Very odd thing to say, but there is some significance to that, is there not? Yes, but you have to go back further in history. You have to, <laughs> you have to go to Eleanor Roosevelt because she was the first champion of universal rights and so on and so forth. And once the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out on 10th of December 1948, she posed in front of the cameras and, and showed a large poster of that Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she considered it to be the universal civil religion. And this is the connection to our topic. And obviously that particular uh, development was then reinforced by other American presidents. And I believe one we have to point immediately to is again, William Jefferson Clinton, because he made speeches in regards to the civil religion. And he made a no sharp distinction between domestic and foreign policy. And he was presenting a vision of a world community of civil faith. That particular understanding of civil religion has been exported to the entire world. And this is the particular mission the neoconservatives wanted to achieve. They wanted to make the world to their own liking. They wanted to export the particular American democracy to all the countries in the world. And you know how they did it. Obviously, yeah, we yes. can point to the war in Afghanistan. We can point to the war in mm -hmm. Iraq and so on and so forth. But rather badly abstracted from what we think of as Christian ideals. They are abstractions, democracy, freedom, liberty. They're, they're not rooted in history anymore, are they? They're just no. ripped out. And now they are these almost like platonic ideals for which we must fight. Um, you lead us towards this conclusion, really of this horrible vision of a global civil religion. Yes. And this connects immediately to the kinds of conversations we've had before and those that I've had with Patrick Wood, where you've talked about technocracy as something that seems to be shaping up for the world. And you particularly have pointed towards technocracy as being essentially religious and that it always was. Yes. Could you say something about that and what we've said today, how that connects 
with a possible vision for a technocratic future? Yes, I believe it's technocracy as a faith. That was my belief all along. And obviously, we had already um, two interviews, I believe, three years ago on that very topic. So I would advise your listeners to revisit these particular interviews. However, my contention was always that technocracy started out to be a religion, and it was called the New Christianity by Henri Saint-Simon, that French philosopher in the early part of the 19th century. He wrote the book, The New Christianity, and published it in 1825. And out of that philosophy slash ideology grew technocracy. So it was conceived as a civil religion from a very first moment on. Mm. And it has never changed. It has changed terminologies, but the core character of it has always remained religious. And this needs to be pointed out today because the term technocracy is uh, becoming a rather fashionable term even here in America. Some professors of political science have, or one particular has come out just recently with his own book publication, which was called Technocracy. And he's appearing on TV here in America. He's being interviewed by the main uh, newspapers, Washington Post, by some news magazines like Time Magazine, describing his vision for America, his future vision of America, and he, he is unashamedly using the term technocracy. He said, we need to get rid of the presidency. We need to get rid of the Senate in America. We need to totally uh, change the, the way how people get into power. We need to appoint them. We should not give uh, the citizens of America the chance to vote for their own particular president, and so on and so forth. So this is the new meme, if I can use that word, uh, here in America. They want to get rid of the entire yeah. Yeah, democratic system here in America. And so if there is to be, should there be a global technocracy ever set up, then it would still have the same pattern of civil religion that we see around us. So it would yes. be presumably quite happy to coexist with the vestiges or the shells of existing religions. Oh, yes, you can be a Christian. Yes, you can be a Muslim. You can be Hindu, whatever you like. So long as what you do does not impact upon what the state wants to do. Yes. And the state will presumably appeal to um, religious leaders and will use religious language and it can all nicely coexist so long as your individual religion is private and unobtrusive and does not actually rock the boat in any way. I presume that's the kind of structure that would still exist with technocracy. Exactly. This is what it is. And this is why I mentioned that example, um, Prime Minister Morsi, who eventually obviously was demoted, but when he got into power in Egypt, he said, I'm a technocrat. And you can follow me being a technocrat and remain Muslims. A technocracy is very adaptable. It can adapt itself to any and every religion in existence. But it itself is different from any other faith. And it is a religion. And there was one element to this that I wanted to bring into the conversation. This whole approach that we've just been discussing is very Hegelian, it seems to me. And some of the materials that you sent to me showed the influence of Hegel yes. way back in this kind of thinking. You had a book called The Christian State by George Heron, and it's very Hegelian. Yes. Um, the state needs to be the manifestation of Christianity in order for it to work. And you also mentioned a Samuel Zane Batten, a Baptist minister, again, about the turn of the 20th century, very social gospel person. And the quote that you had from him in one of your presentations was very Hegelian. I haven't got it exactly, but it's something like he was talking about the state and the church are complementary institutions. They're differentiated on the ground, so to speak. So when people think yes. of the state and they think of the church, they think of, oh, yes, they're separate. But then he talked about a higher unity yes. in which they cooperate, you know, in a way that's perhaps not seen by the ordinary people. And I yes. think, wow, that is very Hegelian in thinking, a higher unity. And so I see that in what we've been discussing about a possible global technocracy, a higher unity in which we can all agree, so long as we don't try to press our distinctives, we can all get along. But of course, 
if you are accepting such a situation, then you are necessarily going to be compromising on what you really believe. And I think that is something that we need to be very aware of and something that we need to resist in our own ways. So I suppose the last question has to be to you, if we've got a picture of this in our minds, we know what may be coming down the river in future. How can we resist this? Obviously, we're not going to be calling for people to resist in any kind of violent way, God forbid. But how can we stay true to what we believe when the state is taking on the clothes of religion and saying, you must believe this and you must act in this way, and it goes against what we actually believe to be true. How do we resist that? Well, let me pick up on that particular quote you just mentioned by Samuel St. Baden, because it leads into my answer. I have a quote in front of me, so I can quote it verbatim. Uh But church and state have become thus differentiated in form and function, that they may become truly complementary institutions and may attain a higher unity of the spirit. And I believe that particular quote out of that book, The Christian State, which Samuel Bento who was a Baptist minister, and he published that book in 1909, is very telling because he doesn't say that we have to have a state church, a state religion here in America. No, not at all. We will keep the churches independent, but we will tell the pastors to align themselves, align their own thinking, align their preaching with state policy, to create that higher unity of the spirit. So in a sense, it's still a a soft method of persuasion they use. But nonetheless, you also see the teeth in it because there's state coercion nonetheless hidden behind it. So my expectation is that there will be some form of coercion be imposed or be used. And the churches will not, the Christian churches will not be left alone. And I believe we have seen that already in regards to these marriage ceremonies, which had to be conducted in the churches between same-sex couples. This is where the state intervened and said, yes, you have to do it, even though it may be in opposition to what you believe, but you still have to do it because the state mandated it. So you see that process continuing in future. Yes, and and accelerating and becoming more uh, severe, I would say. But what should be our response to it? Well, we can obviously point to the first epistle of Peter because he described the existence of a Christian church in a similar situation, obviously during the era of the Roman Empire. And obviously he gives uh, us Christians a lot of good advice how we should conduct ourselves. We should continue doing good. We should uh, still pray for the political authorities and so on and so forth. But our first and only allegiance is to King Jesus and we worship him and him alone. Mm. And if the state doesn't like that, well, we have to pay the consequences, but we will never give up our allegiance to Jesus. And indeed, I suppose part of our task is to inform people so that they understand what's going on with respect to this, which is what you are trying to do with your many presentations and your missions. How open do you find people to this kind of message? It's not easy to grasp, is it? No, it's not. And it's not done in one lesson. <laughs> no. And no. and I know in some churches I was just given one hour and it's very challenging to, to <laughs> convey what I really want to say in that short of time. However, that particular church I gave this presentation uh, just a few months ago has taught me already they want me to come back. They want me to give all the other lessons I have prepared on that particular topic. And I believe I have six right now already prepared. So they are eagerly anticipating my return and they want to know. And they realize, just by giving that one presentation, they realized they need to know. They need yes. to be prepared in regards to what is ahead. And this and is a church in America, is that right? In America, in Columbus, Ohio, yes. correct. Yes. Right. So they were not offended then. They didn't no, understand not at all. what you meant at all. No, good. Quite the opposite. They, mm-hmm. they want to know more and they want to understand. And I think this is a very good attitude to assume. Now, you may disagree with me. Okay, 
but please take the time to understand my argument. And perhaps I have something indeed well worth listening to. It may be a help to you, and I believe it will be a help to you if you understand these issues well enough, because the Christian faith is at stake, and because we are allured by that state called away from true Christianity. We should resist it. We should not be rebels, but at least we should be aware of where the state court tries to impede us in our Christian faith and practice. Absolutely. So we should be aware and we should basically stand our ground in what we believe to be true. And I think your message, I really do think it's a very important message. And I hope that people will take very seriously what you have said. As you say, they may not agree with everything that you've said, but it's always important to listen to something that is as well articulated as you do. I agree with you. In principle, I think this is a very, very important subject. It's not something easy to talk about. I think I've said that two or three times during our conversation. This is very convoluted necessarily because we're talking about history, theology, philosophy, the things that you do so well, bringing them all together. And I'm, I'm delighted that you've come on again today to talk about that and to put those pieces together for us in perhaps a way that people will be quite surprised by. And I know that sometimes people do listen to these interviews more than once. So I'm going to encourage people today, please do listen to this interview more than once because there is so much in here and it will be worth all of us listening to what Dr. Edmund says and taking it in by listening to this at least twice. <laughs> so I don't often say that, but I'm going to say that today. So thank you ever so much, uh, Martin, for coming on the show again um, after a three-year gap, which is, I still I'm amazed by. It's been wonderful speaking to you. And I do want, just before we close, to point people to your websites that you mentioned earlier on. You have them in the English language, you have them in the German language, but I believe you've consolidated websites now. So could you yes. give us the up-to-date URLs for your sites? Yes, it's Werks Institute, one word, Werks Institute dot US or dot CH, which stands for Switzerland. Uh-huh. Either one would work. And if you have an English browser, the English site will come up automatically. If you're a German browser, the German site will come up automatically. Very good. And there's the spelling of institute, of course, in English with an E, in German without an E. Which is it? Yes. Yes, if you use the CH ending, you have to leave off the E at the end of institute. If you use the US ending, you have to include the E at the end. Excellent. I will, of course, include links so that people don't have to remember that. But uh, always good to know how to get to the information immediately if people are interested. And I do hope people will be. Thank you again, Dr. Aldman, for coming on the show. Wonderful to speak to you. And I hope we shall speak again before the next three years are out. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was my pleasure to be on your show. 